Greetings ladies and gents, and welcome to the batch video for the web novel Thieves Dungeon from the website Royal Road. This video will contain chapters 2.1 to 2.4 and as always I hope that you enjoy. Chapter 2.1 Rude Awakening How many rats lived in the city of Colton, occupying the squalid in between spaces? Not even Argent knew, but they knew Argent. Rats did not have names, they had distinct aromas, telltale scars that they could pick a familiar friend out of a crowd of thousands, but they did not have names. Except her. Roughly translated from the crude language of ratty kind, they knew Argent as she who is with us. In that name, the power of her having a name at all was burning through the city in quiet ways. The rats were getting bolder. They were coming up with the in-betweens and underneaths, the edge of civilization. They were glutting on the cheese and half drowning in wine. The young Bravo rat, there was only one thing to do. Steal a gem. Any gem that sparkled like a star from the unsuspecting ear or out of a jewelry box. Carry it down the secret ways of the rats into the sewers neath the city. And there would be danger, lurking spiders and deadly serpents. The way could be lost, a labyrinth of tunnels turns down into the dark. And the sheer smell of human filth washes away the scent trails that rats usually follows. But carrying on and through, a brave rat would find his way to a secret place and lay his prize at the feet of a queen who shines brighter than any jewel. Do that, they knew, and they would be accepted. Do that, and they would be invited through midnight paths and daring raids. Do that one small thing, and they would have a chance to win excitement, pride, even a name of their very own. Even Argent was surprised by how many flocked to her nascent calls, by how many interested tidbits of rats of the city had found to bring to her. That day they brought her whispers, something was about to happen. The humans were flocking, massing above the dungeon, their mages bore shiny crystals and the smells of rare incenses. There was spell work in the air. Argent perched on the rooftop shingle, watching the major set up a contraption, shining crystals and manor-infused stone tall, a three-foot strands, the sun breaking into rays of different colors as it passed through them. Thousands of rainbow lines streamed down into the cobblestones of the street, as they adjusted and tweaked the crystal's position. The line began to form a pattern, a scintillating mandala. It was directly above the dungeon's heart. Despite her best effort, Argent had been unable to learn spell work. She had no way to read the spell that was being formed by the mages, syllable by secret syllable. But it couldn't be good. At her side was the bravest rat she knew. They were eager to go, preening themselves that they were fast, cunning, and strong. They were young, and the specter of death didn't praise them. They were willing to give their lives. That was why she, as their leader, had to be unwilling. She refused to let them waste themselves for her approval, because when you throw away lives, it would become easier and easier to continue doing so. That was the callousness was reputation without hesitation. She would go herself. Argent skipped down from the roof, landing on a windowsill, a water barrel, the street, there were tufts clearing back the clouds so the majors could work. Their eyes closed, their fingers twisting in complex knots to form intricate symbols in spell work. None of the muscles spotted the silver rat darting underfoot, not until it was too late. She flashed in a blur of quicksilver, landing atop one of the crystal strands. The mage nearest paused, his spell work spluttered off his fingers in a spray of drying sparks. He reached out to stop her, and it was too late. There was a flash as she pulled the crystal with her as she leapt again, seeding out the stand toppling down. The formation broke apart, lightning jumping between the crystals, sizzling bolts of pale blue raking across the mages, and one long serpentine bolt smashed into Arjun's side. She was thrown across the street, silver fur singed black, and her back leg twitching spastically. The crystal fell as she rolled along the cobbles. The shadow of a boot lifted over her. The street ripped apart with a massive shudder, the earth buckling upwards and splitting in two. A man preparing to squash Argent fell backwards as the ground shifted underfoot. 
The trembling quaking continued, the nearby houses starting to crumble, walls caving inwards and their roofs bending to a slot until the rough thatch and clay tiles came atop, crashing down. A hole was being carved out of the earth all the way down to the dungeon beneath. It was going wrong, the tripods toppled in each breach, and one of the mages caught up in his weaving of arcane designs failed to see the rapture reaching the tendril towards him. The yawning chasm carried him down into the avalanche of crumbling stone. It was chaos. Chaos! The human bodies rained down, breaking as they hit the ground below. Sunlight gouged in my beautiful luminescent gardens, and with it a terrible sense of exposure seized me. The humans had simply made their own entrance. One of them was still alive, his leg brutally fractured. My mantis reared up in front of him, splaying her glowing wings out, making them buzz as though the air was a rapid flicker that turned her spotted rings of pale and lurid purple light on the underside into a dazzling blur of color. The injured man gawped, staring at the awestruck confusion at the gleaming lights before him, and all the while he was shrinking, shrinking, growing small enough that the mantis could overwhelm him. When it stuck that he was barely larger than the insect, and how much he was crushing the serrated claws, it ripped through his throat in a bloody display of dominance. I watched all of this with a scent of restraint. I could no longer shape the first layer, and I was determined to let it stand alone, even as adventurers threw down ropes and clambered down into the gardens. A full eleven armed men descended. I was resigned. This was Kobuchin's test. Worst of all was the fact that the Nacra spider's lair had been cracked open. Their secret doors were twisted and warped, becoming all too visible against the backdrop of the cracked stone. The many of them had been tumbling out of their secret dens and onto their backs, bladed legs scrabbling in the air. Men with spears made short work of the injured spiders. One of them went down suddenly, cursing and crying in pain. A glass-bodied snake had sunk its teeth into his ankle. Calling up the unseen through the dense and colorful fungal blooms that rose to the waist of the invaders. The leader of the crew rescued him, seizing the snake in a mechanical hand of bronze and ripping it away so brutally the man cried out again. With a squeeze, he crushed the serpent to a pulp within his grasp, shaking the remains from his palm, and he tossed a vial of what looked like anti venom down towards his wounded comrade. They were prepared. The invaders had formed such a rough circle in the center of the gardens, fending back the nacre spiders that crawled down from their ruined nests with swords and spear. Every second counted against them, but they were moving fast. One of them was weaving spar work, golden diagrams spreading under his hands. Nothing! I can't see anything! So, at least my law prohibiting divination was working. We'll have to sniff out it the old-fashioned way. Men! Spread out careful now to scout the surroundings. The man in the mechanical arm shouted. Only a few feet from the major's casting, two men armed in spears were fending back a nacre spider, jabbing at its pearlescent armor as it slashed them with bladed-like forelegs. The fact that he could maintain his concentration that close to running battle told me that they were hardened veterans. My dungeon was mounting a counterattack of sorts. Serpents crowding down towards them as the low underbrush and fungus and moss, but they hacked away at the mushroom jungle, even as they shrank down into it, denying my beast's cover as a fine strategy. It was also inflicting hideous damage to my beautiful jungle of gleaming lights and translucent fungal bodies. Another man fell, pulled into the real fish. His fate was sealed with a sudden tangle of tendrils around his ankle and a sharp pull. Before anyone could move to rescue him, he was under the water, being slammed into their blunt, battering rammed heads. The air left his chest in a burst of bubbles, fountaining out from his mouth. The corpse was pulled down into the mud and murk of the underwater labyrinth. It was a small victory, but one I cheered. I was a nervous creator, watching his works take the first independent steps. And at the same time, I was furiously scheming a way to prevent this kind of breach from happening in the future. A thin man with scars in each cheek vaulted through the fungal blooms, coming to a halt at the edge of the wide, shallow pool with brides of Haven swum. He sniffed, almost seeming to sense the riches in the air, and he dipped his blade into the water, wriggling the shiny metal like a struggling bright insect to lure one of the placid gold-scale beauties near. 
He almost didn't see the fungal golem lurking in the reeds around the pool's edge. The lion lunged with him, paws extended, and a thin man moved faster than I would have thought being possible, rolling backwards and somehow leaving his knife impaled in the lion's neck. Another one was drawn from his boot as he popped back to his feet, calling over his shoulder, Hey, there's treasure over here. Like a pack of dogs catching an unfamiliar scent, the adventuring party turned as one. He had said their favorite word. End of chapter. Chapter 2.2 Last Chance Careful. Nim saw everything go out of control, and his golem arm clenched in a metal fist until the steam hissed at the exposed gearworks. He saw his ally sprinting towards the promise of wealth, and he froze for an instant, realizing that he couldn't control them. They were veterans, yes, but not of delving. They were soldiers, bandits, and monster hunters. They knew how to cut off their fortunes out of the world. They had no experience in the underground realms of dungeons, where the world took its own pound of flesh in return. He watched as a thin man, Claith, dodged a sweeping lunge by a fungal lion, his dagger scoring a long, raking hit down the beast's side. But as it flicked past him, it smashed backwards with its hind paw, striking into the meat of his calf with the long, curved claws of chitinous black. Chase cried out and toppled onto one knee. Instantly, reinforcements were there to cover him. But the lion was gone. It vanished with the swish of the closing foliage and the dense, swaying stalks of the luminous fungal blooms. Two men stumbled through the patch of bubbling, piled-up puffball blooms, their fat, white surfaces dotted with knobs of hardened chitin. There was a thunderous crumpling of noise and puffballs burst apart in a brief roar of flames, an eye searing an ethereal puff of white fire. Those chitin knobs became flying shrapnel that tore the men apart. Their one that lived was blind in one eye and scarred with burns across his body. A walking corpse. The ten he'd brought to were gone already, two more wounded. Touch as little as possible, Num roared into the ringing aftermath of the explosion. He took three steps forward and some instinct made him turn back. A spider perched over a fallen man, the one who'd been bitten by the snake. He was bone white, thick plates of shaggy rough metal covering its bulbous brown body. Its fangs descended for the wounded man's throat. Num twisted his wrist and just so, feeling the machinery in his arm. His little pistons and pulleys pulled taut, and deep inside the spar were inscribed bronze gears began to turn, and a golden light bolt around the knuckles as he took three running steps forward and swung his fist, engulfed now in a golden fire towards the spider's skull. He should have listened to his own advice. The spider's body blossomed into flames of explosive clap and a wave of force lifting him off his feet as though the world turned white and glinting spears of crystal flowing out of the spider's detonated body. From the thin slime of the viscous yellow blood splattering outwards, a husk around the inner core of molten flame and fury. Nim saw the world in frozen moments, the fire erupting out of the cracks breaking open on the spider's calcified form the crystals planning out towards him as he floated, weightless midair. The breathless crashing halt as he hit the floor and saw above him as the light shining through the ruptured ceiling. And then time restarted. There was blood on his face, there was blood everywhere. His metal arm was punctured, the gears and pulleys clicking and hissing in protest, setting up a thin whine and fading machinery as he tried to lift the bronze fingers skywards. He tried to speak and felt something wet blossom from his chest. Looking down, he saw a spear of white crystal thrust through his lung. Froths of mixing air and blood heaved out around the edges of the wound, with every rise and fall of his chest. The foamy pink mixture was what his life and breath were all leaving him. Fumbling into his shirt, he drew out the tiny vial Afri had awarded him. It hadn't fractured, thank God. Mage glass was harder stuff than steel. A tiny drop, just one drop of shining elixir sat at the bottom of the rounded vial. He tilted it down a briny, alcoholic heat spread down his throat and into his chest. He could feel the torn fabric of his body starting to writhe, and individual strands of his flesh rippling forward and its resurgent motion as they stretched themselves together. 
the next part would hurt, and all he could do was breathlessly curse the heavens reaching up. Nim took a spear crystal that had fixed him through the chest and ripped it free. The shout of pain bubbled out of him as a little surge of bloody spume. Over the course of three heartbeats, a hole sealed itself shut. The ringing in his ears subsided, replaced by the shouting and clamor of the battlefield. Strength surged through his limbs. He felt incredible for a man back from the dead. The look on his men's faces as he stood up made it clear that they thought he was dead. He wiped his bloody face, a thin papering of crystal still tapering his skin, shining shrapnel pockmarking his ugly mug. With a vicious grin, he clapped his stunned second-in-command on the shoulder and went running towards the promised treasure. The elixir was like a fire beating through his veins. It made him want to move and fight and win. His men were stomping through the shallow pond in the shadow of the enormous statue of a crude man-like figure. His face propped against his fists as though his feet were dripping in the pool. Bright, golden-scaled fish tried to escape, but they were chased down and seized and hauled out of the water, flopping and fighting. A knife slitted their fat, pale-spotted stomach, and gold-tinted pearls came spilling out. Fat little pearls as big as an eye, puny ones the size of a bead, all with lovely butter-gold hue, shiny, rough fingers of his men as he scooped them up in the stuff and packs and pockets. Come on, then. Do you want to be rich men or rich corpses? He slapped them on the shoulders, gripping with the mechanical hand, until he felt the bones begin to creak. We have to keep moving. There's better stuff deeper in, I promise you that. It was hard to get the moon moving again when they caught the scent of gold. But they weren't idiots. They knew they were in danger the more they lingered. Let's scout the gazebo. There were three paths going through the jungle, three locations that the dungeon had highlighted. One was the pool with the golden fish, the other looked to be a gateway, and the third was an enormous gazebo made of shiny glass. Something about it just pulled him. A little voice that whispered danger was drowned out by the elixir's lingering, hady rush of strength. Are we? Claith said feverish, and his face pale. His comrades had a leg bandage, but the blood was still leaking through his clothes. Are we smaller? Well, get home soon enough, old boy. The man tended to his wounds, laughed, and Nim paused, looking around. The jungle loomed around them. Corkscrew sprouts of fluorescent mushrooms lifted higher than their head, and their tall stalks lined by the dozens of delicate spines joined together by membranous frills and helix patterns. No, we are. That brought them all short, pausing a glance around to confirm it for themselves the worst. It was true. They were shrinking, vanishing into a dense and luminous undergrowth. Come on, move it with me now. Shouting, he led the way towards the Palace of Glass, letting his men cut down the fungal blooms in his wake. A sudden shiver in the moss warned them that the second before it was too late. A half-transparent green viper reared up, coming waist-high now. A goliath. Its pink mouth yawned open to Fang's bed. It lunged for him. His metal fist caught it at the side of the head. Sparks burst from the breech of the upper arm, and the vicious haymaker spread the creature's brains and skull into a long spray of gore. Its headless body twitched and writhed, and he continued forward, running now, heading for the gates of the glass gazebo. As he pushed open the door and stepped through, there was a moment of disorientation. He was his own size again behind him. His men seemed to step through the lens of a telescope as they crawled through the doorway. Only five of them now, three more gone. Chaith was the last through, limping heavily, needing another man's support. Inside of the gazebo was octagonal, the house of treasures, the walls glittering so beautifully, redolent, with the beams of light bouncing back and forth from one mirrored surface to the next, spinning an opulent web of gold. Them felt dazed, he stepped forward towards a long table of faintly blue glass, like ice, where a chalice after chalice of gold sat waiting, all but crying out to be taken as prizes. A cry of warning came from behind him, and he threw himself aside. Nim rolled across the ground as a blade slammed down where he had been a harpy before. No, not a blade, a leg. One of eight, a creature, a half-man, half-spider, its face hidden behind a white-pink helm, its body covered in armor for some pale and pearlescent stuff. In its hand it carried a long glaive, and with one sweep two heads went flying. 
Them lunched forward, throwing all of that into a blazing crunch, and the arachne lifted one arm and caught the blow full on. He felt the bones beneath the armor bend in a moment of contact. He heard a hiss of pain. He felt the impact rocked through his own body and pressed his back foot down into the floor, until the glass began to break. Armored spider was thrown back into its hind legs, using the front two to slash at him, forcing him to duck back. Its weight came crashing down behind the brutal overhead sweep that Nim ducked away from, playing for time now. His arm needed time before it could strike with full force. Behind him, the men were frozen, unsure what to do, skittering around the edges of the room trying not to attract the beast's wrath. A dagger bounced off the armor's shoulder. Chait let out a weak laugh, incredulous at himself, before he could make another sound or take another breath. He was skewered through the glaive's point. Blood dripped down as he was lifted from the ground and flicked off the blade. Another man lunged forward, hacking with an axe. The haft of the glaive whirled around and struck him stupid, stunning him with a blow across the back of the head. The bladed leg stabbed through his calf, and he fell. Another pierced through his torso. But Nim could see the weakness, the slowness, and the left arm that had been used to block the blow. One more... He curled his metal hand into a fist and ran forward. The glaive swept so quickly, so neatly through the air, he never saw it coming. Only instinct let him dodge to the side in time, his fist sweeping upwards towards the arachne's left shoulder. This time, he never made contact. Instead, he caught a vicious kick across the chest, tearing open his leather cuirass and throwing him back. The glaive blurred through the air and Nim thought that he was dead. But no, it was claiming another life, a man trying to creep out of the arachnid monstrosity. By the time Nim managed to stand, blood weeping from his chest and a long gash from his hip, there was no man of his crew left alive. None except him had survived. And he wasn't far from joining them. The strength of the potion had lent him was leaving, ebbing out of him with a relentless strip of his blood leaving his flesh arm trembling, smoke wafting out of his metal one. The dark sockets of the creature's helm stared out, and then he reached out, lifting a cup from the table. Drink. (sighs) And why not kill me? The words came out of his mouth before his woozy, injured mind could think better of asking questions for which there was no good answer. The maker wishes to put his other creations to the test. The armor creature replied simply. It is a chance, however small. I'd step forward, offering the cup. He could smell the blood dripping from his weapon, filling up his beautiful room. And God's sight watch over him. No man couldn't stomach that. Couldn't live with himself, or die with himself, if he went out any other way but struggling to the last drop of blood. Nim lunged and was stopped short. The beast let its glaive fall aside and simply shoved its five sharp fingers through his chest. His ribs broken like tinder, a cough, a spew of blood down his chest, and he tilted his head down to see the creature's hand flexing tighter. He felt his heart beating being crushed between its fingers. A poor choice. They pressed down, and that was the last thing he left. Darkness rushed in. End of chapter. Chapter 2.3 Earth and Sky You have reached the sixth level. You may now choose an attunement of a rare or below to increase to the next stage. Improved attunements increase with the chance related of evolving appearing, an offer of new benefits. You may choose to receive an additional schema slot or an expansion to your mana pool or the Great Will's Whim 1. It was all but celebrating over the prospect. For the first time in a long time, I'd entered into the decision space. A great void full of drifting mists where possibilities existed, in bubbles that showed potential of each path. Only four now, the four rare grade attunements that I'd chosen in the past. My legendary attunement of fortune floated alone above me, its surface gone grey with a pike so that I couldn't see within. Down one route by taking the attunement of disguise, I could form false core that would distract any attempts to define my real core's location. Unfortunately, much of this use was redundant with the law of my first floor preventing divinations in their entirety. 
If I improved my enchantment to glean, light within my dungeon would begin forming into loyal wisps, a type of weak elemental. Gloom would provide shades, their dark counterpart. But it was the attunement of jewels that spoke to me. Once I improved the highest graded gemstones would begin to produce not mere untyped manner, but earthen manner, the same stuff I'd found in the elemental geode's nest, a powerful and potent substance that I sparingly experimented with already. I took it without hesitation, and after a moment's thought, selected the additional schema slot as well. Memorizing a creature to a schema allowed me so many more options in shaping its design, and I would now need new creatures for my second layer. The decision world faded out as I made my deselections. The battlefield above was settling, the losses on my side unfortunately severe. Still, they hadn't made it past Gobichan. It was a shame that the last of the adventurers chose to go out the old-fashioned way. I had so many new creations to try. My field of lament was flourishing, and I completed the luminous butterflies that would serve as hypnotic traps. My sudden interest in deadly snails had yielded wonderful results. All I needed was a living specimen to actually reach my second floor. Bodies of the golem-armed man and compatriots lay cooling around Kobuchun, who bowed, sensing my attention. I let waves of approval radiate out as I devoured the bodies, turning them into brief lived flames of manner. Some of those flames swirled into Kobuchun, strengthening him. Since I had given him the blessing of a blade dancer, he was already formidable, and would only continue to grow at the cost of eating up some of the potential mana from my first floor. He was a new kind of creature, a guardian. Even his missing leg had been restored. I was curious about him now, in truth. The spellwork inscriptions around his soul were deeply complex. An ever-turning clock of golden diagrams writ in pure mana fire. Inscribed within them was a map of his being that could be used to restore him from nothing. I would compare it to a way to living potential as a stored inside an egg, every portion of the yolk able to become an arm, a leg. Somehow, the nascent body stored the complete memory of what was yet to be and every inch of its fabric. This was the same, but the inscription directly into the soul. Soul inscription magic. They were the same thing. Humans would work wonders because they had complex, wonderful patterns of mana radiating out from a central core while my creatures were mutable and adaptable due to having simple constructions. Why was I so fascinated with this? Because I finally realized how to make my creations that could work their own magic. Until now, I'd only been able to evolve towards magical abilities, not build creations to have them from the start. This step forward would only be an evolution for me. I would need to give them a soul and inscribe that in much the same way that I would make a shard, Shardcrafting could even be understood as granting a portion of my own consciousness, a weak byproduct of a soul, to the creatures of my dungeon. This medium was a poor replacement, but enough for me to arm them with a basic level of inscriptions. Inscriptions that would bring about true magic would be a new magnitude of difficulty. Unfortunately, the only way I knew of getting a soul was to devour enough humans to trigger a mana overflow and hope it delivered. The first part was easy enough. I consumed the human corpses and the remains of my poor destroyed creations. I flooded towards an overflow. You have created blessing of evolution, grants a single burst of mutagenic potential, and slightly reduces the threshold for further evolutions. I could have sighed, only incredibly useful, not exactly what I wanted. My attention returned to the second floor, pondering how to fix the first. I would need both to seal the breach before more adventuring teams arrived, and to ensure the new one couldn't be torn with my walls and time with the humans decided to come calling. Half of that was easy. My experiments with the earthen manipoles left behind by the elementals had borne three results. One was the stone tusk rats that did such good work fetching me lumps of quartz and gleaming opals. Another was a new improved mesmeric snake, a creature that could now only be called a lesser basilisk, infused to the power of earth and its gaze could paralyze a full-grown human. But finally, I had the stone spitter spiders, a simple evolution of the nacre spiders. They were bigger and clumsier, but far better armored. 
They thick, concoagulating spit formed into a rocky substance as soon as it dried, enabling them to disguise themselves as standing boulders. They would be perfect for repairing the breach, but I needed more than simple cure of the symptom. There was an underlying issue that dealt with it. I began with a worm, a lowly creature, but vital to the soil. I rebuilt my specimen from the ground up, with the digestive acids borrowed from my burrowing worms, and it held the ability to tunnel through rock. With a parasitic lifestyle from a spider wasp, it would seek out larger creatures and lay its eggs inside of them. These would be companions of the stone splitter spiders, living inside of their shells and hatching from the flesh. And in return, they had one final gift to impart, the ability to spin out thin filaments of dark iron. The stuff was toxic to my creations, but the worms didn't have to live for long. They would exist in short while in the candle flames of life, blind and earthbound their whole existence, burrowing through the stone as the spiders created it, in the process consuming and excreting as they moved, and they would layer a web of dark iron throughout, shielding the stone spinner spiders against the magecraft and proofing my walls against being torn open. It was an ugly solution, requiring me to work with worms and parasites, creatures I would normally bulk at. I did my best to pretty up by giving the worms a faint blue color, but in the end only felt hideously ironic, a worm the color of the sky that he would never see. Iron sky worms, short-lived due to the dark iron they excrete, these creatures live in a parasitic cycle with stone spinner spiders. While they could be classified as a pest, they dampen the excesses of mage intruders. Hopefully that will resolve the problem. I had Arjun carry up a shard to one of the large stone spinners, one I just recently forged. It was a beautifully as a tumuline, half green and half yellow. Accordingly, it had been able to accommodate twin enhancements, dual shard of might and fortitude. The twin-colored stone bears a dual enchantment, adding greatly to the bearer's strength and constitution while granting intelligence, creates a telepathic link to its creator, the Nameless Dungeon. The beast was less than pleased about my other gift, the parasitic worms, but there was a religious fervor in its mind for me, a desire to please, and it suffered in silence as it twined their way into the rocky shell. The Goliath had a dull, broad mind full of hungers and paranoid weariness, even my shard didn't do much to sharpen those basic instincts. But it would serve to lead its people up through the first floor, joining a strange array of spiders already there. I gave it a simple mission, repair the breach, and a promise. Do this, and I would grant it a name. It had been so long since Adamant died for me not to pass on the gift of a name to a new and worthy bearer. This Goliath spider, strong of leg and deadly of venom, was as worthy as any. Now I turned my attention away. I had accumulated quite a haul of loot, and I sent to Rom's little friends the cobalt up to fetch it. I had acquired the ability to create a blessing by consuming enchanted and magical gear, and it was high time that I put it to use. End of chapter. Chapter 2.4 Cowardice Gilbert awoke with pain throbbing in his face, marking a long scar from the right edge of his mouth, curving up, nearly touching the side of his nose, and splitting his right brow. The eye was lost, he was halved, the pain was burning, the thing writhing like a worm. He turned to find a pair of boots resting beside him. They were cut from rich dark leather with silver buckles, and they were so fancy, so clearly not meant for orcs that he hesitated for a long moment before snatching them up and putting them on. The leather was soft and well-worn on his feet. He glanced around and Ilbar realized that he was in a room of glass. The cutlass still lay at his side, a beautiful thing, curved and scribed with runes that ran along the spine of the blade and down the basket hilt grip. He shone the light past that seemed to ooze out of the ice-colored walls. He lifted it, feeling reassured and nearly made a horrible mistake, as the monstrosity of eight legs hauled its way up from the hole in the center of the floor, its every feature clad in a gleaming white armor. It looked like a pale and ghostly light. If its hands had stopped trembling, he would have fought. Instead, he stood there, the pale knight unbuckled his helm, and the long vertical slits rising crown of the spikes making it seem like death's head. 
He breathed a sigh of release as the moths came down, revealing the strange alien but familiar face of Kobuchin. I'm glad you're awake, the spider said. Where? I mean, why? He reached up with a tasty scar. I was still raw. The wriggling lion raised flesh. In the mirrors of the walls, he could see a wide as the smallest finger, wrinkling and skinny pink. I almost died, didn't I? Yes. In the future, you will die for real if you do not learn to fight. There was the blood dripping from the enormous glaive Kobuchin carried. Blood on his armor. It ran down in the purling plate of the threads of ruby, coated the enormous curved blade with a ceremonial spear. It clung so thickly to the tassel, hanging just beneath the tang of the blade that the gold braid had turned pure dark red. Ulbo couldn't run away, the steady patter of blood dripping from the iron stink of it. Hypnotizing him, Kobuchan followed his eyes and tched in annoyance. Wiping it with a cloth, he set the glaive aside and began to peel away his white pearl armor. The glass man, where is he? Elba stumbled out. It had seemed so easy to resolve to fight. His last firm thought before the long pain dreams as he recovered from the wound. Now that his resolution ebbed out of him and the first smell of blood, it seemed foolish. It seemed impossible. It wasn't what it was. But, as the spider said, if he didn't learn how, he would die. In the ever forest, hunting, and he will not return soon. You must go to him. Elba stood at the gate of the ever forest, trembling in his boots. He didn't want to. He never asked to be a coward. It was like a fear lived in his body, not his mind. Another animal occupying his skin, a feral fear. One that made him shiver and freeze when he stood in the gateway of the unknown. But he had to move. He gripped the sword slightly and promised that he was better than this. Better than the burning fear told him to turn away. As soon as he stepped through, he felt an air different. The ancient mist saturating the smell of leaves and loam met his nostrils. It was a scent of old growth, a primordial fog of rain tapered underneath the forest canopy for eternity. Unmoved by the wind and leaves pent up, growing each day with the forest, lived and died and went to rot, black to the earth and squished under the new boots. Something hooted in the brush. An owl, with seven eyes arranged in a ring, stared at him. It stared intensely. The trees closed in around Ulva as he followed the signs carved into the trunks. His hand brushed over the bark. Fresh sap stuck to his fingers, and he trudged through the deep mottled layers of wet leaves. The forest coating into a gloom until the lights and the leaves parted into a golden sun crept through where the last skies of the subterranean dark. In the wind made the last veins a gold ripple and a shift, swimming across the forest floor. And he came to a place where there were two marked trees. Both seemed equally fresh. Sap oozed from the cuts in the pale green beads. Insects came to lick the tree's blood, swarming around the arrows that pointed in opposite directions. On one path, the darkness of the forest swallowed up all the faintest light and flitting shadows. Everything was grim. The other led up to the trees and seemed to lighten, dappled gold and crackling open in gloom. It was obvious which one he wanted to be right now. In the back of his mind, he also knew that it was also the obvious choice. The easy choice. Maybe the glass golem had left both these marks, just as likely a predator had seen the first mark and decided to set a trap. If that was the truth, then his life hung in the balance, and he couldn't let fear steer him. How likely was it that the trap would aim itself towards the dark of the forest, where anyone would be reluctant to go? If the ambusher was looking to tempt him, surely it would choose the light and easy way. These were his thoughts as he nervously and slowly turned down the dark path, shouldering his way between the closed set of trunks and stumbling over the roots. Something was behind him, Elba knew. The ears caught a slight creak in the branches as it moved from one to the next. Ilbar came to a place where the trees bent in vast archway, their leaves entwining into a grim, lightless tunnel that yawned before him, dripping vials of moss hung from the overhead, one foot in front of the other, although both tried to tremble the way out of it, shaking so hard that his teeth were chattering and feeling dead already, feeling hollowed out from the inside by the gnawing of his fear. Ilbar stepped forth. 
and a thing came rushing towards him. There was barely time to throw himself aside as an ape, with its red fur and rusty-like blood, crashed towards him and passed. His last minute dive to the floor saving him, only he'd left his blade behind, lying on the ground. The beast turned to Ilbar and flinched, trying to crawl backwards. Its face was a tusk skull, and the fur peeling back to reveal bleached bone and curling yellow sharpness. The ape was built of crude, top-heavy muscle, with the giant leathery hands that swung at the ends of long arms like clubs, knuckles dragging on the floor. It lunged for him. There flash of green. The glass golem crashed into the beast's side and sent it rolling, somehow slipping away as they tumbled together through the leaves, avoiding being caught when crushed underneath. It regained its footing and leapt back into the time to avoid the sudden leap from one of those enormous hands. The sword came to it out of the dazzling arc of silver. The hand fell to the ground severed. The ape clutched the stump as he let out a pitiful roar. Coming up onto his feet and staggering back, the glass golem was having none of it. It lunged forward and fainted back to dodge the crude backhand. It darted in again, jabbing his plane down sideways into the joint at the back of the leg. The beast collapsed onto one knee and finally caught the glass golem with a blow, driving its elbow down in a strike that brought all of its huge bird bulk to bear. The glass golem twisted and interposed its horns, and while it was sent skidding back, feet tearing furrows into the soft mud of the forest floor, the beast was left with bleeding horns piercing through its one good arm by the fawn's antlers. The beast was left broken, sagging, trying to drag itself back towards its nest. The glass golem stepped between it and safety, pointing its sword towards the ape and something soft brushed against Ilbar's arm. It was the fur of a silver fox who carried his sword in its mouth. It laid the blade against his lap and stepped aside, waiting. The glass golem made no move to finish the ape, only stood between it and retreat. They both realized what was happening at once, though the helmet and the tusk one and the ape locked with Ilbar, the intense fury in its gaze making him flinch as he staggered onto his feet. God's sight, they shook. The whole of him was shaking, and his breath came out in ragged gasps. He tried hard to think, to fight with his head first and his blade as a last resort. The beast was bleeding horribly, so it had to come to him. If he advanced now, he'd be giving it his one advantage. Time. Time was on his side, and the ape knew it. It climbed ponderously to its feet, barely able to limp along on its injured leg, bent, lopsided by the mismatch of length of its arms. It lunged for him, a lunge that turned into a fall as its bad leg gave way entirely. He ducked back from the clumsy sweep as he hacked away at the arm as it passed. There was barely enough strength in this arm to break through the beast's thick, clotted fur, leaving a shallow gash. His father had taught him how to fight, he knew the movements, but his own body, steered by the animal fear, refused to fight with him and not against him. It came to him again, crawling across the ground and smashing an open palm into the dirt. Again he retreated and swung, making another shallow addition to the wounds. The third time it played him, a half strike, a faint back, and as his sword darted forward, the real blow leapt forward and met him. Ilbur's world was blotted out by a hot, white, bright blossom of pain, spreading before his eye, and he turned to the world of white fire. He felt the weightlessness seize his body as he was lifted from the ground, and the air left him as he crashed back down, rolling. The blade was no longer in his hands. His vision came back in its blurry, distorted, his one eye filled with blood. The beast was holding itself towards him. If it had two working legs, it would have already torn him apart. The blade lay on the ground behind it. He was going to die, he was going to die, and there would be no place for him amongst his ancestors. Not if he died like this, without a weapon in hand. Chasius, the afterlife, was reserved for warriors. And anger surged through him, for once in his life, anger that he'd never had a choice to be anything but one thing that he can be. Anger that every other option had been stripped from him, that he'd been born an orc, that for generations his people had been forced to fight, until every softness had been stripped from them, and they were hard, scarred things. 
He lunged for its face, clawing his fingers into the sockets of the bone helm it wore. It was surprised for a second, but the sudden surge of violence, his fingers met something soft. And then it caught him by the leg and ripped him up from the ground. Pain swept the world away again as he was lifting him, swinging him by the leg and then smashing him against the tree trunk. He felt his bones creak. He was going to die. That thought settled over him as he lasted a long, long time. Longer than he should have ever left. Alba opened his eyes slowly. The ape lay on its side and heaved its breath, making its chest rise and fall in an uneven arrhythmic gasps. Blood was staining the leaves below, filling with the cold autumn bodies like cups. Two weeping streams of red ran from its sockets of its helm. It was blind. It was dying. It could no longer even stand. He had won. Hulbar's leg wouldn't support his weight, disjointed from the sockets and dragging painfully beneath him as he took one, then two steps, before collapsing to the ground. The fox stepped forward and brought him his blade again. He used it as a crutch to close the distance, and then lifted it up as the bait's throat. In his mind, he recited the prayer for fallen warriors his father had taught him. Then he cut down, again and again. It was no clean death. There were no clean deaths. Only brutal, fearful, bloody business of killing. End of chapter. And that concludes this patch video. I hope that you enjoyed. If you wish to support the channel, there are numerous ways to do so down below. Until next time, I hope that you all have a good one. And I'll see you all in the next video. Cheers.